Hello biology students, this is Mr. Gales and today you're looking at the chemistry of water screencast session number two. In this screencast we explore the unique properties of water. You should remember that when we looked at screencast session one about the chemistry of water we focused on hydrogen bonding which is a result of the polarity of the water molecule. So we'll be referring to those concepts quite often. Remember the water molecule and you can see a little model of it right here has a partially negative end up by the oxygen which is the red atom and then a partially positive end over here by the white hydrogen atoms. That polarity plays a very important role in water's properties as does the hydrogen bond which is the ability for one water molecule to have a weak interaction with another adjacent water molecule and this is where we have the hydrogen which is partially positive bonding with the partially negative oxygen on a nearby atom. All right, So those two things Water's polarity and water's ability to hydrogen bond play a really important role in what we're going to see today. All right, now this table here, <clears throat> you don't need to take the time to write all this stuff down. What I want to talk about here are the properties that you're going to see in this screencast and really what causes them and their overall effect. Um, there are lots of properties, things like water being solvent or having a high surface tension, but what is important for you to notice here is the reason for all of these properties is pretty consistent. You can see that it's due to either the polarity of the water molecule or the fact that water can go through hydrogen bonding. It tells you that those two properties, those two uh, aspects of water's chemistry are very important. And obviously the effects are also important too when you look at moderating the temperature of the earth or keeping your body temperature constant or you know, facilitating chemical reactions. These are the kinds of things that simply life cannot exist without. And so water plays a, a hugely important role in the chemistry of life. All right, now our first main idea is surface tension. This picture per perfectly illustrates what surface tension is. You guys have probably all seen surface tension out in your lives. If you're walking around by a pond and you see these little water strider insects, their ability to stand up on top of the water like this um, is exhibited because of, or is, is possible because of surface tension. So what is surface tension? Uh, surface tension is when there are enough hydrogen bonds that are holding the water molecules together and they're holding the water molecules together tightly enough that the water surface acts like a membrane and is able to have enough tension so that something that doesn't have a great mass can actually float on top of it. Alright, our next main idea is capillary action and to begin we need to understand what a capillary is. So that in and of itself is a main idea. A capillary can be defined as any tube of extremely small diameter and some examples that you see um, blood vessels. You guys are familiar with arteries and veins. The capillaries are the extremely small blood vessels that sort of connect arteries to veins and they deliver all the blood directly to the cells. Um, that's a great example of a capillary in our bodies. Another great example of a capillary in a, another living thing is what we call xylem tubes. These are capillaries that are found in plant stems and they're responsible for moving water up and down through a plant. Now how capillary action plays into this? Capillary action is best illustrated with this picture. And if you look carefully at it, what you're going to see is that there are water molecules which are taken out of the soil, down by the roots, that are traveling all the way up through the trunk of this very tall tree, out to the leaves, and then out, evaporating out into the atmosphere. So how does that possibly happen? Well, it's based on a tendency of water molecules to stick together. This is cohesion. So ten tendency of molecules of the same kind to stick together, cohesion. So hydrogen bonding makes that possible. And you can see that you're going to develop kind of a column of water molecules that results from the cohesive uh, nature of the water molecules and their hydrogen bonding. Now, if you have, in addition to cohesion, if you have capillary tubes that are made out of some sort of polar substance, like water is polar, if you, if you have uh, those tubes made out of another polar molecule, the water molecules will be attracted to whatever that substance is, and that would be called adhesion. So the big difference between cohesion and adhesion is when cohesion is when you have two molecules of the same kind sticking together, adhesion is when you have two different kinds of molecules, but they still stick to each other because of those polar interactions. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a video here of capillary action that I think will really make sense of how this works and why this is important for plants. And then we'll get into our next main idea. But plants and water have another dramatic impact on our atmosphere. Using a remarkable system, plants transport water from their roots to their leaves, where photosynthesis takes place. Water, with its high surface tension, 
the elastic quality of a liquid surface that makes it hard to break, is able to travel up the vascular system of even the tallest trees. Once at the top, it evaporates back into the air through the leaves or needles. A single redwood releases up to 500 gallons of the precious liquid through its needles in one day. So how does it get up there? A solar-powered hydraulic pump. Water molecules, they attract each other. And for each water molecule that leaves the liquid column in the leaf, another molecule will move up. And the net result is that by evaporating off the surface of the leaf, we have a whole stream of water moving continually from the soil into the root and eventually out in the leaf. All right, the next main idea we're gonna take a look at is heat capacity and the ability for water to moderate temperatures. Um, essentially what we have here is a situation that exists because of water, water's ability to form hydrogen bonds and not just one or two or three but many hydrogen bonds thousands of hydrogen bonds um, with the molecules that are, that make up water in a body of water um, because of all that hydrogen bonding water has a bit better ability to resist temperature change than most other substances temperature is essentially a measurement of how quickly the molecules are moving along and heat is a, a form of the energy. So those are kind of some terms that we'll, we'll talk about here. Now, if we consider oceans and large lakes, um, huge bodies of water that have the ability to moderate the temperature of nearby land. So what's happening here? Uh, let's take a look at this picture. This is a, a weather forecast from WGN News. And uh, you can see this is, this is um, we have Lake Michigan here, huge body of water, and the area right around the lake tends to be cooler than the outlying areas. And that's because as the sun is beating down on the lake, um, a lot of that thermal energy is going into actually breaking apart the hydrogen bonds that are keeping the water together in the first place, rather than immediately heating up the, the, uh, the area around it. So you may hear the phrase, it's cooler by the lake in the summertime. And that's because that, that water has the ability to um, essentially moderate the temperature of, of the land around it. Now, the reverse is often true in the wintertime, where the areas right around the lake tend to be a little bit milder than the outlying areas, and that's because that, that lake now is releasing energy back as the hydrogen bonds are being um, broken in the water molecules. So that's important for uh, moderating the environment or the climate around us. Water also has a, an important role in moderating the temperature within our bodies. So when we sweat, that's actually helping us to keep a stable internal body temperature. Uh, essentially what we're looking at here is a property called evaporative cooling. When, when you sweat and the sweat is evaporated away from the surface of your skin, the remaining surface, right, the surface left behind, which is just your skin, is left cooler. All right, so those are two really key ideas that sort of combine into this heat capacity and temperature moderation. I'm gonna again show you a brief video here that will help you to understand that a little bit more. The hydrogen bond enables life as we know it, but because of this bond, it takes considerable heat, depending on volume, whether supplied by a stove or the sun itself, to raise water's temperature even one degree. This ability to absorb heat is known as heat capacity. Water actually has the second highest heat capacity of all of our common substances on the surface of the earth, with ammonia actually is the only common substance that has higher heat capacity. That's why we use water in cooling our internal combustion engines, our power plants, and the human body. The evaporation and perspiration keeps our temperature regulated. And similarly, one of the reasons that our change of seasons is gradual rather than abrupt is that water absorbs heat and releases it rather slowly. So the water on the planet tempers the change of seasons. The deep blue oceans suck up solar energy, much like the roof of a dark colored car on a sunny day acting as a planet-wide heat engine that circulates water currents, air currents, and precipitation. The sun causes water to evaporate from dewdrops, streams, ponds, oceans, and lakes. The vaporized water rises, cools, forms clouds, and eventually condenses into rain droplets or snowflakes. It all comes back down to Earth, and one way or another, whether it percolates into the groundwater or flows on the surface of lakes or streams, virtually all water eventually works its way back to the ocean. All right, next main idea here about the important properties of water is the fact that 
ice has a lower density than liquid water, and therefore it floats, which is really important. Uh, water is one of those few substances that actually does have a lower density in its solid form. Most, most substances uh, that's not true of. When we look at liquid water, what's happening is the, the molecules are moving around fast enough where they're making hydrogen bonds, but then they're breaking right away and reforming with ones around them. So those water molecules are in constant motion, and because the, the bonds never have a chance to persist, the molecules can sort of pack closer together. What happens when the temperature decreases and the molecules begin to slow down is that the bonds that form uh, are going to have a more consistent um, bond length, we say. And so what you end up with is molecules that are stretched out as far away from each other as is possible. And that results in this uh, structure that we see, this sort of crystalline structure that we see um, when ice forms. Okay. That produces obviously uh, less density because there's um, more volume being taken up for the same amount of mass. And so what we see when we take a look at water in its three phases, solid water will float on top of liquid water, and obviously gaseous water is up in the atmosphere. Now again, real quick video that helps to explain why this property is so important. H2O's molecular structure also allows for a truly miraculous transformation. As water freezes into a solid, the hydrogen bonds form a crystal lattice that has a lot of empty space in it. Unlike nearly every other substance known to man, it becomes less dense as a solid than a liquid, turning traditional physics on its head. The result? Ice floats on water. Because of this, when we freeze a body of water, it freezes from the top down, not the bottom up. If ice didn't float, if water became more dense as it froze, then our ponds, our lakes, our oceans, rivers would freeze from the bottom up and would eventually be solid ice and would be much less conducive to. All right, one final main idea, one final property about why water is so important, and that's water is a good solvent. In fact, it's the best solvent for living things. So to understand what this means, you need to understand a couple of key terms, um, solute and solvent. Solute, uh, solute is a solid that would dissolve in a solution. Uh, a great example that you've probably all had experience with is making Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid is a solution. The solution has both solute, which is the solid, and the solvent, which th does the dissolving. So in Kool-Aid, your solute is the sugar particles that you are putting into your solution. The solvent, which is the liquid that does the dissolving, is your water. And in the example we see over here, we're taking table salt, which is chemically known as sodium chloride, and we're adding it into water and we're essentially dissolving the table salt. We're dissociating the ions that are held together. And uh, the way that this happens um, is due to those opposite electrical charges and the polarity of water molecules. So another term that you need to understand here in terms of water's ability to be a good solvent is the term hydrophilic. And let's break that word down. Hydro refers to water. Philic is to love. Or philia is to have an attraction to or to love. So a hydrophilic substance is any substance that will dissolve in water. Uh, great examples of these would be ionic compounds like sodium chloride. And if I have a, I have a little model here of sodium chloride, and you can see here that the sodium ion is going to attract to the, the positive cation is going to attract to the negative oxygen. And then of a nearby, we have the sodium, uh, or the, rather the chloride ion, which will attract to a hydrogen. And if you have enough of these, they will literally pull apart the sodium and the chloride. Right? So now we have dissociated ions. So ionic compounds um, will dissolve in water. So will molecules with polar covalent bonds. And really the reason for both of these situations is that the electrical charges attract to the partial charges on the water molecule, the partially positive end and the partially negative end. Great examples of organic molecules that are hydrophilic are any salt, sugar, or proteins that we might uh, encounter. Now one other term, hydrophobic. Let's break that word down again. Hydro meaning water, phobic is afraid of or fear of. So these are substances that will not dissolve in water. Um, this would be molecules where the majority of the bonds are nonpolar covalent bonds. And that would be found in, in something like th this that you see here. The gray is meant to represent carbon and the white is the hydrogen. So this is sort of the basis for a hydrocarbon backbone that you might find on an oil or a fat. 
or a wax. And because the bonds are nonpolar here, right, this is rule two on our electronegativity rules, carbon and hydrogen form nonpolar covalent bonds, there's no electrical uh, polarity involved in this molecule at all. So whatever I do with this uh, polarized water molecule, I can't get it to attract to this um, nonpolar hydrophobic substance. Okay. Water is a great solvent. This is one of the most important properties of, of water as its importance to life. Now I'm going to show you a real quick video clip that shows water and its ability to dissolve and then we'll wrap up with our final slide. You probably have figured out that water equals life. To begin with, it is the perfect medium in which life can form and reform. But why? What properties of water make it the fluid of life? Water has a very important role in all of the chemistry that happens. A huge array of materials will dissolve in water. And because water enables other things to dissolve in it, it provides a medium where those things can recombine and form new chemicals. Water takes a kind of divide and conquer approach to breaking down other chemicals. In the case of table salt or sodium chloride, water's negatively charged oxygen atoms surround the positive sodium ions, while the positive hydrogen atoms surround the negative chlorine ions. By splitting the two elements apart, water literally breaks down the structure of the salt. Moreover, because water remains liquid at the conditions of the surface of the earth, you can move around in all different kinds of directions. That's called degrees of freedom. So things can move around, flip around, vibrate, stretch, rotate, and then they're able to try novel combinations and hook up in new ways. This surely helped life get started on the early Earth. The chemicals, the raw ingredients that make up life were constantly sloshing around, bumping into each other, and combining into new chemistry. Over millions of years, that process can lead to living organisms. Okay, so we've gone through several properties of water. Uh, we talked about the, you know, resisting the change of state, resisting the change in temperature, both due to hydrogen bonding, which allows for the moderation of Earth's temperature or for our own body temperature. We certainly looked at the ability to, for water to be a universal solvent that's due to its polarity, facilitates chemical reactions cohesive and adhesive nature, hydrogen bonding and polarity. It's the transport medium. It allows for capillary action. High surface tension due to hydrogen bonding uh, that allows for water striders, insects to, to walk across the surface of water. And then less dense as ice than as liquid water, also due to hydrogen bonding. And this allows ice to float on water. So as you can see here, water is extremely important. Uh, its structure, its chemical structure, allows us to have these properties which have absolutely important effects for life on Earth. All right, so this was the properties of water, unique properties of water, the water chemistry of water screencast session number two, and uh, we'll see you next time in biology.